Better Governor um, facilitating this webinar on behalf of Governors for Schools for you this morning. The focus, as you've seen, is uh, how we monitor the quality of education judgment from the, uh, the new Ofsted framework. And uh, please, if you have any questions at all as we're going through the webinar this morning, do feel free to uh, either type them on the dashboard or if you'd like to come on live and ask your question, then raise your hand and uh, if we possibly can, we'll unmute you and uh, let you uh, ask your question on air. So what we're trying to do today is uh, give you a hopefully a little bit of uh, increased awareness of the new Ofsted framework that came into place a uh, week before last. Um, thinking specifically about that, uh, that new judgment that's called the quality of education and hopefully ensure that by the end of the session, as governors, we've got some strategies in place that actually ensure that we do have that appropriately strategic overview as governors or trustees in our schools and academies um, of this judgment and um, thinking about the evidence that we've got that gives us the confidence to uh, uh, know what's happening in our schools and to know how effective we are. So we're going to start off by talking about the framework itself. Now, a lot of you will have come to um, possibly Hot Topic uh, webinar that we did back in the autumn term, or you'll have read um, about this in the media or perhaps heard about it on social media. But just a little bit of a um, brief recap on where we are thus far, um, as far as the framework's concerned. So first of all, there's no change in the overall uh, grading system as, as it was in the past there still remains the possibility of schools having a, a grading of outstanding, which a lot of schools are aiming for, but good, which is the minimum requirement uh, that the DFE is set for all schools. Most schools will either be good or outstanding, and there are two further judgments um, for schools that have not reached that level yet. There are still four judgments, uh, but the shape of those four judgments has, has changed uh, with the emphasis, as Stu said, on the quality of education judgment, which we are going to look at in detail today. Leadership and management is perhaps the least changed overall, uh, particularly around what it says in terms of how they're going to look at governance. Uh, and with a, it being very early days yet and, and no full uh, re uh, Ofsted reports yet, the approach seems to be a very integrated approach to governors working with uh, leadership teams in schools to develop that partnership approach to leadership and management as a function. The other two uh, judgments, behaviour and attitudes and personal development, they've been separated out. This is largely as a result of the uh, Ofsted research project that they did, where the conversations that they had with parents, the feeling was very strong uh, that behaviour and attitudes uh, required a separate judgment. Uh, overall, and you'll see later on in this um, bullet points uh, further down this slide, safeguarding has not gone away uh, and often parents of younger children put safeguarding, I want my child to be safe at school, I want my child not to be subject to bullying, I want other children to behave well, I want there to be good attitudes for learning. Those things are often more important to parents uh, than the quality of education. That's, that's the overriding concern. So behaviour and attitudes have been separated out from personal development and it is that personal development area where you will find those things such as healthy uh, living, the approach to well-being and to um, mental health issues and that um, enrichment activities of helping a whole child develop across uh, a much wider range. This is not divorced from the quality of education judgment because, of course, those extra opportunities, those development of the, of the whole child, those um, create a much richer environment for curriculum uh, to be developed uh, across uh, the whole of these uh, areas. There is a focus on off-rolling, and we did mention that last time, but if you're joining us for the first time this, uh, this session, this is a practice where a school persuades parents that their child would be better being taken off the role of the school uh, and it means that the school does not have to exclude that child or it's the possibility that these children are not going to perform well and so hold back the league table ratings for that school but it is prevalent in year 10 
uh, in secondary schools. That's not exclusively the domain of year 10, but it's, it, it's often seen there. And we have a duty to educate children up to the age of 18. So finding another school or ensuring that children continue their education is, is really um, affected by this practice of off-rolling. Offset will be looking at uh, whether your school even strays near that territory. So it's very important that we understand both what off-rolling is and that we hold our school to account for ensuring that we know children, have, if they've left our school, are going on to a secure educational opportunity elsewhere. Both types of inspection, a full inspection, which can change your grade, a section five inspection, and a section eight inspection for good schools, which just comes to ensure that you are doing those things which the new framework requires of you and are still a good school. Uh, those are both over two days. So the idea that the short inspection, a section eight, was shorter is now not the case because they need to spend that time looking at that quality of education judgment and making a reasonable best fit decision about that. Okay, and uh, just uh, following on from that last comment that Linda's made there, we put a quote here of which is taken from the Section 8 handbook, and as Linda says, the word short doesn't exist anymore in the Oxford, uh, sorry, in the Oxford uh, lexicon these days, but this says inspectors will focus primarily on that quality of education judgment during those Section 8 inspections, and they still apply, as Linda said, as well to uh, good or non-exempt schools. Now, there's a few things that we've added on this next slide, which are um, developments that have come out really in the first week of uh, the inspection framework and perhaps the, uh, the, the first week of the, of the school year as well, um, from Ofsted in terms of announcements and guidance to inspectors, etc. And these do relate primarily to this quality of education judgment and how that applies to uh, looking specifically at curriculum arrangements in schools. And Basically, what we're saying here is that there are transition arrangements in place specifically when it comes to Ofsted inspectors looking at a school curriculum and evaluating how much progress still needs to be made to get it where Ofsted believe it ought to be at this point in time. And what this does, in essence, is allow um, inspectors to use their own professional judgment and use that on a best fit basis. So realistically, what they're going to be saying is, well, if we look at everything else that the school is doing, we look at its plans, uh, we look at what they've already done in terms of implementing uh, a new curriculum, everything else but it says uh, on the fourth bullet point there, all other things being equal, does refer to things like assessment processes, the, you know, whether, whether we've got coverage of the, uh, the national curriculum, etc., what standards are, all those are the things that all other, otherwise will all be equal, but if the curriculum has still got a way to go in terms of its development, that's where that best fit judgment comes in, but it is looking at a two-year window. So it's actually saying to schools, yes, we think you're going in the right direction and actually we are going to give you credit for your uh, your plans, your intentions. Uh, the important he thing here to remember is schools are at different stages in this journey. So some schools will have taken account of the, uh, the research document that was published. They will have got straight on with looking at their curriculum, reviewing where they currently are in terms of what our offer looks like across uh, every part of the school from what we teach in the classroom to our uh, extracurricular activities and our interventions and our stretch for the more able, they will have looked at that and they will have uh, either found that they're doing very well and there isn't too much of a journey to go to that uh, at least good judgment within two years and others will be looking at a longer journey. Um, things like uh, humanities and science in primary schools are areas where schools are, have recognised um, as a result of this new framework of, of uh, inspection that they need to do a little bit more in work there. Uh, the transition arrangements themselves are in place for a year. The best fit judgment is around are you within two years, as a, is the shape of the journey that your school has planned for itself likely to result in that good judgment if we were to come back in two years and look at it. 
Uh, we've got a couple of questions relating to this one, actually. Uh, Nicola's saying, is it two years from 2019 or two years from the point of inspection? Um, I think, realistically, it's probably two years from 2019. And if you're lucky, um, in the spring term, it may go from there as well. But I think this is just for the early stages of the inspection framework. Interestingly, it doesn't say this in the inspection handbook. This is purely in the, the update for inspectors that was issued in the first week of September. So I hope that answers your question, Nicola. George has also asked a question, could we clarify what we mean by saying they only apply to potential good judgments? Uh, yeah, if the inspection team has already done a lot of work in terms of uh, their inspection trailing, etc., and everything is looking as if the quality of education judgment is going to be good, except where they are right now in terms of the if, of curriculum. That's what they mean. So if there are some concerns that mean that the quality of education judgment, because of low standards, um, may be heading towards requires improvement, then this transition arrangement would not apply. So again, hopefully that clarifies. And there is a team within Ofsted uh, that the inspection team uh, can contact if they are at all concerned about the best fit judgments they're making. Uh, and they're certainly doing that at the moment. And that's to, in, uh, in, to ensure that there is some kind of consistency across all of the inspections that are being carried out at this early stage. There's another question here from Michelle. Um, Michelle is asking, um, with regard to looking at actions and potential results within two years, if a school's vulnerable in losing its good rating, does this mean that as long as the actions are in place are strong, this may be enough to retain good? Uh, no, um, I think you may have misheard, Michelle. We certainly didn't say um, if results are uh, not good. If results are not good, that will not protect you. Never forget that Ofsted is an acronym for the Office for Standards in Education, so they will already have looked at your published data. Uh, that does not change. But if this is only about curriculum development. So if there are perhaps areas of curriculum development which are not yet good, but plans are in place, and therefore they're able to judge future intention, that's where it will apply. Uh, and Jeffrey's uh, asked, to us to say a little bit more about the research document. That was, uh, Ofsted carried out a two year period of research with three stages. If you want to have a look at that either in full or the su executive summary, it is on the Ofsted website. And it, it considered the views of parents, of schools, uh, and of a range of different types of um, professional organizations in coming to some conclusions. Uh, so that, that is published on their website if you want to have a little bit more of a look at that. Uh, we've got one, one other question on this now coming from Kim. Um, can extracurricular activities be an integral part of the curriculum or must they be um, obviously additional? No, they are absolutely part of the curriculum. The national curriculum or the taught curriculum as such is part of your broader curriculum offering in any school. That's supplemented by any enrichment activities um, in terms of school trips, visits, visitors to the school, as well as the extracurricular um, opportunities that are provided. And many schools are also thinking what do they do in their before and after school um, wraparound provision if they offer that? How does that enhance, support, develop um, the curriculum, the pillars of the curriculum development priorities that they've got in place? So it is anything a child learns at school can be considered uh, part of the curriculum. Uh, we've got a couple of questions um, come in with regards to uh, outstanding. And I think it's fair to say that what we're talking about here, of course, is that the vast majority of good schools at the moment will get a Section 8, not a Section 5. So they'll, they will get the Section 8 inspection. That doesn't change judgments. And of course, the only thing that the Section um, 8 does is provide you your school or your head teacher with a letter that says the school remains good. Um, similarly, if you're a non-exempt school and you're sitting on an outstanding judgment at the moment, it will comment about the school remaining outstanding. It will not judge those individual four areas, so quality of education, um, behaviour and attitudes, etc. That only happens in a full inspection. And a, a question around those schools who are already outstanding that may be exempt. Um, and for those schools that are getting a full inspection, what we're talking about in this quality of education judgment today is no matter whether Ofsted are actually planning on coming to visit you, this framework 
if it's not Ofsted that are coming to say, we're going to have a look at this and ensure that you're doing it, it is the board itself's prerogative to ensure that the, the school is taking account of the curriculum in its broadest sense under this quality of education judgment. So if you're an exempt school, they're going to try and bring a few more exempt schools into um, subject themed inspections so that they can have a look at those, but you are still required to check that your school is, is embarked on this, this journey, embarked on this piece of work. Uh, and irrespective of whether you're getting a section five or a section eight inspection, you still need to concentrate on developing your understanding and working in partnership with your school to know how your school meets and intends to meet in the future the quality of education judgment. Okay, um, so thank you for those questions there. Keep them coming and we'll attempt to actually answer them all if we, if we can. Um, but just moving on now, a couple of bits of key um, documentation for us. Again, we're not recommending these as bedtime reading, just so, but just so that uh, everybody in the webinar this morning is uh, aware that they exist. Schools Inspection Handbook um, on the left-hand side of the screen there in front of you, and the Section 8 Handbook on, on the right-hand side. Um, even if your school is sitting on a good judgment or an outstanding judgment, if you're a non-exempt school at the moment, be aware that you need to look at both these handbooks because the full detail on, for example, the quality of education judgment, which we're talking about this morning, is only contained in the um, Section 5 handbook. Now, we've already covered this, but just wanted to show you this slide. This is a copy of a slide that Ofsted produced themselves um, way back in January, February time this year. And this, this doesn't just list what those new judgment areas are that Linda uh, referred to at the top of the session, but this is showing you in very graphic terms the weighting that Ofsted are saying is going to be given to those judgments. So you'll see that the quality of education accounts for 50% of, and if you were to say that you know, these four judgments together equal the overall effectiveness of the school, this is saying that roughly 50% of the weighting of that is given over to the quality of education and then the remaining 50% is split into three equal chunks covering the other three areas. And that's why really that's the driver for this webinar this morning to make us as governors and trustees think about, well, if it's that significant a proportion of the inspection time, how significant is it as far as our strategic overview as governors is concerned? And how much time might we as, a, as governors therefore need to spend on developing our understanding of it? Indeed. And we are about to hopefully launch a, our first poll of the, uh, the session for you today. And uh, our first poll really is asking you the question, has your governing body thought in any detail yet about the quality of education? So I'm launching that poll now. So that ought to be on your screens now. I think it is. Um, you've got four potential answers. So have a look at those and cast your votes, please. And the voting is taking place very rapidly. We're up to nearly 70% already. So uh, if you haven't voted yet, we'll give you a couple more moments to do that before we cut the poll off. Okay, I think everybody who wants to vote has done so now. We seem to have uh, petered out in terms of the, of the total going up and virtually everybody has voted. So we will close the poll at that point and share the results with you. And that ought to come up as a bar chart and that's up on your screen now, I hope. And uh, you can see those results. Uh, so thinking about what we might want to see in the head teacher's report. So you've added it to the head teacher's report. It may be as a subject heading uh, on your agenda or on the on the report itself what is it you are going to do what do you require your head teacher to tell you about uh, in that report and this is where i think we need to develop our own understanding as governors about the sorts of things that we need to be asking about um, so be aware of that um, not many of you created a new committee and that's certainly not an expectation that you would create a completely separate committee but it may be a reshaping 
of your teaching and learning committee. Uh, it may be that your terms of reference are going to be reshaped to just really have a focus on developing that understanding. Uh, and the majority of you have ensured that it's on the agenda somewhere. Uh, and so again, it's about what will you be doing under that agenda item? What will you need to see? Um, will, will it involve looking at the school's current self-evaluation um, summary that it has made about where it believes it is currently on that journey? And what might that future vision of where we might be looking to be in two years time, what would that look like? What would we need to recognize in that journey as governors to ensure that we are monitoring that effectively? Uh, and there are um, almost 25% of you who are saying that you haven't yet had an opportunity to or started a discussion about uh, what you need to do in partnership with your school uh, to start making this journey towards this new judgment. So some food for thought for, for, for some of you uh, there in, in different sorts of areas. And uh, we've had a comment here from Janet um, saying there's not an option in the poll to say that we started talking about it last term. Um, that's the gold star option, Janet, of course. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Sorry, that's an oversight on my part. But um, hopefully if you started talking about it last term, that puts you in a very good position. And either you would see that coming up as a recurring agenda item or perhaps in your head teacher report or even both, as Linda said. So uh, it's um, the that's actions good following that talking that are then the, the golden ones. How is it reported in your minutes? What actions arose from that? How will you monitor it as it goes forward? Okay, so let's go, come on now and talk about this uh, idea of the quality of education judgment and what does that mean for us as governors? And uh, um, sorry, this is, this is my slide, this one. I just have a penchant for Google Images and this just amused me because I was reading something yesterday, um, an Ofsted document specifically about the curriculum and that actually made the point that this isn't revolution, this is actually just an evolution. This is really taking Ofsted a stage further than they've actually been in the, have been in the past. Um, they've always looked at the curriculum. It's been looked at historically, perhaps in a slightly narrower function. And I think what, what um, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector Amanda Spielman is saying at the moment is the curriculum should be the bedrock for everything that happens as far as teaching and learning is concerned. And therefore, Ofsted are developing their practice based on that research that we talked about earlier in the session to take it to its next stage. And the law, you know, the DFE have not changed what they expect schools to do in terms of education. Um, Ofsted have changed their approach to measuring how effective schools are delivering it. Yeah. And that's the reshaping here uh, that we just need to understand. Yeah. I don't forget, of course, that uh, um, Ofsted don't make the rules at all. Um, the government sets the agenda as far as legislation and regulations are concerned. All Ofsted are doing is deciding how they go about inspecting that um, to ensure that, as Linda said, those standards are being maintained in schools. So some of you will be familiar with the um, these uh, three words that Ofsted are using um, when it comes to evaluation of the curriculum, um, intent, implement and impact. And some of you may have heard us um, talk about this in the past, but it is very important and Ofsted keeps stressing this is not something that should be split and looked at as three completely separate and unrelated concepts. This is all part of the idea of developing a curriculum that informs learning and ultimately prepares children and young people for the next state of stages of their lives, whether that's um, further academic study or into the world of work. But I think from a governor's perspective, it's worth, it is actually worth picking, picking these apart and just thinking about what does it mean? And from a governor's perspective, how are we monitoring that all three stages of this, yes, it's one pro, it's a single process, but all three elements of that process are being given the um, amount of attention that they deserve in our schools. The first one, the intention, really is all about, you know, what are we trying to do? In other words, you know, it, it's a visionary question. Do we have a curriculum vision? What is our curriculum trying to achieve for the children and young people in our school? And, and Adam's just asked a question um, for an, uh, an SEN school, a special educational needs school. Um, How's the quality of education judged, for example? 
is it unreasonable for our pupils to achieve any GCSEs when they leave at 18? Sorry, it is unreasonable. Um, that's fine, Alan. This is about the context in which, we're in, in which we operate as school. So the curriculum intention in certain special schools, because there are some lots of special schools where youngsters will be taking GCSEs because they're, because they're able to, to access the curriculum. But in others, because of perhaps the cognitive ability of some of those youngsters, um, that may not be appropriate. And there, it would be the question that would be asked is, well, so how are we adapting our curriculum? How are we shaping our curriculum to meet the needs of our students for whatever they're doing in terms of the next steps in their lives, whether it be at age 18 or 19 or whether it be at age 24? And I think the, the, the guidance gives that message quite clearly. How have we designed the curriculum to meet the needs of all our students. So you know, for those of us who, who are not in an SEN school, there will be some children in each school that have additional needs. Either they're very um, gifted children, they've, they've got talents beyond uh, what the normal curriculum would offer, or they have extra um, needs because they need to access it in a different way. So how are we designing the curriculum to meet all children's needs? And then the intent is that they make a good transition into whatever it is next so to the next school that they go to to the world of work to the world of apprenticeship and training so what else then needs to happen in the design of our curriculum to help our children do as well as they possibly can and i think it's worth saying as well on this intention side that um Ofsted will be looking to see if schools are thinking about all pupils. So this isn't a, a one size fits all. This is about saying, how are we shaping our curriculum? And it may be in the delivery, but it might be in the structure to make sure, as Linda says, it is accessible to all groups of pupils. Uh, somebody asked a question um, earlier on about extracurricular, and I talked about enrichment. How do we ensure, for example, disadvantaged pupils, those who are accessing pupil premium, or so those who are um, generating pupil premium, rather, I should say, how do we ensure that access to all enrichment and all extracurricular provision is open to those pupils? That's, that's about intent as well, I would suggest. So there are lots of elements of this that as governors we need to be thinking about. So inclusion ought to be a bit of a byword running through this as well. And even when you're looking at the range of extracurricular activities that are offered by a school, does that meet a wide range of um, expectations from pupils? How have pupils been engaged in developing or shaping what those extracurricular opportunities are? And if you're offering uh, sports and, and activity-based um, curricular activities, what about those children who are less physically able to undertake that? How are they going to access that? What alternative arrangements are in place? And that brings us really on to the second, the second one of these, the implementation. And this is fa fairly obvious, I guess, what, what's meant by this. This is that, OK, we've, we've set the plans, or we actually probably haven't set the plan, we've set our vision as far as uh, the intent of the curriculum is concerned. How is that then translated across individual subjects and across the curriculum as a whole including all of its elements, enrichment, extracurricular, et cetera, as well, um, how that's taught, how teaching is supported, et cetera. So the implementation is very much at that level. And I think from a governance perspective, all of us can actually appreciate this is actually quite operational. So my view, and something that I know Linda and I have been saying to governors when we've been training, is that this isn't an area that governors would necessarily expect to delve that deeply into because it is highly operational. However, that does not mean, again, in my view, that uh, we ignore it completely. We do have to have an understanding of how the curriculum is being shaped. So, for example, as governors, we know that there is progression in the teaching of history from year three up to year six, and we're not repeating a topic on the Victorians doing exactly the same things in year four as we did uh, perhaps two years ago in Key Stage One. So those are important considerations for us, um, but we do not have to be experts in every single subject. Now, Linda mentioned Ofsted a little bit earlier in terms of experience from um, uh, inspections that have already taken place. Obviously, it's a very, very small sample base. They've only been going for two weeks yesterday. Um, and I think, sorry, two weeks Tuesday. I'm losing track of time this week, apologies. 
Uh, but certainly what we know from anecdotal experience from talking to chairs of governors whose schools have been inspected is that there is a focus on the curriculum and governors are being asked questions and specifically in primary schools at the moment I've come across three schools where questions have been specifically asked about science. Now, that's no real surprise, I think, if we sit and think about that. Science is a subject that has not been tested with SATs for a number of years now, and therefore, you know, that's led to some criticism um, generally, but also specifically in Austin, that maybe the curriculum on science has narrowed a little bit. So Austin inspectors naturally are a little bit curious to know what's happening in schools there. And it would be sensible for us as governors to know how on a, an individual um, subject basis, science just being one example, how are we planning to ensure we get full coverage of the national curriculum and how do we ensure that science gets a fair share of the curriculum time? And this is all part of that governor journey in understanding where you are now and you will have been working on school development plans in the past so you know how you've monitored aspects about the school that are already good so needing to understand where you are now what the journey is so is science a strength in your <clears throat> excuse me in your primary school or is it some an area which you know there has been some development going on um, is another area something that you've had a presentation on maybe by a senior member of staff or you already understand that there's some work happening which is coming back to the governing body to create that pathway of where you will hold the monitoring activities later on in the year. I've got a couple of interesting comments coming through here. Um, Nicola, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, Nicola saying, so, so as far as implementation is concerned, governors should perhaps link this more to leadership and management. Yes, absolutely. I entirely agree with you. Um, and you've then gone on to say, Nicola, um, perhaps thinking about things such as how are decisions being made around um, quality assurance processes? How's the curriculum operating in our schools? And maybe even some, some compliance issues with regards to things like the new relationship with sex education, etc. Yeah, that's a very good point, Nicola. And uh, th those are all those sort of high level strategic strategic considerations, I would suggest, which are entirely appropriate for us as governors and very much should be part of the thinking. Uh, Jeff is coming up and made a comment here. Discussion of intent suggests quite extensive consideration. So how long should the statement of intent be? Uh, that, that's a good question, Jeffrey. Uh, I think I would suggest relatively brief the overall summary statement, but then perhaps for individual subjects, there should be a curriculum statement there about what the intent for the science curriculum, for the RE curriculum, for the geography curriculum, et cetera, should be. The curriculum is an area which needs to appear on the website. So you need to tell parents about what you are offering. So that immediately suggests that it is a much more strategic based uh, type of explanation. Uh, and indeed, uh, parent view, which is the, the mechanism which collects information from parents about their views during inspection, does have a focus on do you think your child is being taught a good range of subjects? So being able to have some communication with parents, some kind of information on the website and some kind of overarching document that would meet the purposes of governors understanding those pillars of intent would be really uh, helpful. However, the much more detailed operational level delivery of that uh, would probably not be what governors would want to or expect to see. And Catherine's put an interesting question up here. Um, we're planning to have some governors doing deep dives. And deep diving is a, a, a term that um, Austin seemed to have coined um, very recently. Um, and Catherine's saying they're planning to do that um, in a subject, um, or presumably in a range of subjects, to obtain evidence about how the school is doing this. Any advice on the sort of questions? Let me come back to that in just a moment. But I think firstly, just to develop what Linda said, I'm not sure deep diving is an activity I would expect governors to engage in. This is not saying to us as governors that we need to become subject experts. That's why we have subject leaders in our schools. Um, I would suggest that the strategic overview from a governor is to know, for example, is there a curriculum development plan for geography in my school? Is there a curriculum development plan for X, Y, Z other subjects? 
what's the role of the subject leader would be a good question for a governor to ask. How does the subject leader monitor their subject to ensure that what they understand of the plans are actually being lived and breathed within their subject on an ongoing basis. Is that development that they have in mind for the subject to bring it up to perhaps where expectation ought to be, is that being replicated in every year group in the school? And don't fall into the trap of believing a subject sits discreetly and unattached to other subject areas. So for example, in developing uh, better writing across the school, you might be working with um, a curriculum offer for art, either during school or after school, to improve children's ability with using uh, a pencil and drawing shapes that will then improve their handwriting. So don't believe that it, everything sits discreetly in nice little blocks because we're looking at the development of writing across all subject areas, we're looking at uh, good reading skills still at primary as part of this uh, new framework. So how does that sit across all areas? And again, I mean, we've got a couple of questions coming through on this on similar themes to this about how we organise governance, how we organise visits, etc. As I say, for I think for both Linda and and me here, what we're not saying is it's a subject leader governor role. It really isn't. It's a subject leader role. Governors, just as with everything else, need to be seeking assurance that this is happening. So I would not be advocating we go back to no. a governor for every subject in the school. That's not sensible. What we should be doing now in a more strategic way is saying, OK, as governors, let's link to certain priorities in our school development or school improvement plan this year. And let's perhaps in pairs, teams of governors monitor those. That might be linked to the, the development of a particular strand of the curriculum in which case it's fine. But this is not about us miring ourselves as governors in operational details um, relating to the curriculum. It's about the strategic overview of curriculum development as a, as a process. And that school self-evaluation uh, process that the school have undertaken, they will have been able to present to you as governors. This is where we think our strengths are. So there's not really a lot of point in a link governor to things that you've already developed and do well. But these are areas which we're trying to develop and these are the reasons why. And those then should be pillars of the school improvement plan. And they may be areas where governors in whatever structure, because not all governing bodies have committees, but whatever the structure is, how are we going to have a focus on monitoring whether that is having the right impact? Yeah. We've got a couple of questions here as well relating to the quality of teaching in schools. Um, Richard's asked a question, does the new focus on quality of education have implications for governors in terms of their understanding of the quality of teaching? Um, again, I go back to my evolution um, slide really. Um, we saw the beginning of an evolution here and a move away from a focus solely on the quality of teaching in the last framework. Don't forget the judgment there was the quality of teaching, learning and assessment. And I think that was really to recognise that teaching is just part of the process. And that's very much really the quality of teaching here is about the implementation stage, isn't it? So that's very much, I think, from my view, part of, if you like, the operational role of the school. What we need to know is, well, what's the quality of education across the school? Are there some variations there? And again, this isn't about getting into individual names, et cetera, but are there variations? And of course, then the ultimate question from a governance perspective, so what are we doing about it? This is not about us having that microscopic uh, um, focus on the quality of teaching in every classroom. That comes out of a broader judgment now, which is about the quality of the curriculum, the quality of its delivery, and of course, the last one we haven't started talking about yet, impact, the quality that has on standards. And you are paying your school senior leadership team to undertake that quality assurance on the teaching and learning. Um, and Nick's asked a very interesting question here, is this feeding into teacher training um, before they qualify? Um, I say it's an interesting question, Nick, that's my code for saying I don't know the answer. Um, I will actually see if I can go away and find out. I would like to think it would, it would be very sensible, wouldn't it? Um, there is always a time lag, of course, because people will be mid-course, etc. But you would like to think that certainly teacher training institutions will be doing that. It may well, of course, be that um, IT, the initial teacher training providers of the teaching schools um, and other um, ITT providers in the, you know, actually working in schools themselves, 
they may be closer to this possibly than um, universities and colleges. So we may see them taking a lead on this, but I think that's something we'll have to wait and see. But uh, certainly you've left me with a question to follow up on there, Nick, so thank you for that. Uh, John's asked an interesting question about if you are one of those governors sitting in front of Ofsted, what kind of questions might Ofsted ask you? Well, they're definitely going to, to say, how do you know? What do you know about uh, the, the, the curriculum? What do you know about the school's actions? But in these early inspections that we're getting some, some verbal feedback from, the idea that they follow a course down a certain subject route and look at that in a little bit more detail is, is clear that, that that's where the focus is at the moment. So understanding what it is your school are developing and how, how you, at this early stage, what does that plan look like and how you're going to measure it? So I know that our school is focusing on developing the science curriculum. These are the things I know about it. This is how we might be measuring it. Um, and understanding the context of your school. What groups of pupils do you have? What are the, the, the learning needs that those groups of pupils have? How do you know that the curriculum has been focused around those? Those are good places to start. It should be a conversation. You shouldn't be caught out by any of this because we're giving you those ways into developing that understanding with your school at the moment. And then it should be, it should be able to be a, a conversation that says, I know these things are happening because. Okay. Um, just noticed that uh, Nicola, Nicola's put a comment up here relating to the last question about initial teacher training providers. Uh, Nicola's saying that there's a new framework for uh, initial teacher training um, coming out in January. Um, I think it's fair, it's fair game to assume that that probably will reflect Tofsted. So thanks for that, Nicola. That's very helpful. OK, so coming back to um, impact. Impact is the obvious bit, of course. This is what we as governors are actually all about. Are our schools being successful in equipping children and young people for the next stage of their education, the next stage of their lives? And of course, when we're looking at impact, a lot of that will be looking at academic outcomes, but not all of it. So there will be some qualitative um, commentary that goes around this, as well as the published data of the school uh, of uh, um, oh, sorry, published data relating to um, yeah, pupil performance. And it's probably worth adding at this stage. There's a lot has been said, and Ofsted keep reiterating that they are not going to be looking at the school's own data. That does not mean that as governors, we do not need to look at the school's own data. Um, there's a very interesting um, and a very short uh, little video clip has actually gone onto YouTube yesterday from Ofsted, from Matthew Purvis, who's one of the, um, one of, I think he is the assistant director for schools. Um, if you follow Better Governor on Twitter, you'll find it because I, re I retweeted it last night. Um, but he is actually saying, no, we're not looking at it. We trust schools to actually um, collate their own data effectively. The question for Ofsted is not what does your data say, but what are you doing about it? And again, that's what Ofsted will be expecting us as governors to focus on. So a typical question they will ask us is to say, as governors, you've had your own internal data, you've got the external data, what does it say to you and what do you know your schools are doing about it? Yeah, so how do you know that? Uh, question that John asked earlier uh, might have a reply that, well, we know as governors because we've looked at internal data, we've looked at uh, progression uh, and we understand from uh, the visits that we've done that these things triangulate together and we can see that we are moving forward in that area. So it, it's about a variety of things. But yes, data is definitely one of those focus. If you're a school that has has been on a journey to being uh, better than it was, so if you're, you're not yet good or you're not securely good, you may have been in the habit of looking at, at progress data for pupils quite regularly. And the new framework suggests that two or three data captures a year, and this is about workload for teachers so that they can spend more time developing pupils and less time crunching numbers, um, you may see the amount uh, or the, the frequency of data reduce. Uh, but that still should help you focus, well, if you're not looking at data, what might a visit to look at the development in science or look at the development in humanities, what might that look like? Um, and in terms of of triangulating what you're being told, that may be a good way to spend your governor time. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions coming through here. Um, 
CAV has actually asked a question. There's a lot of guidance that will direct us to continue stroke deep in our conversations with senior leadership teams on this subject of quality of education. Much of this will be qualitative. Are there any good qualitative measures worth monitoring? Well, sorry, quantitative measures rather um, worth monitoring. The quantitative measures are those that Linda's just been talking about really, CAV. Um, I think for me, it's about how often, and again, there is an implication in the new framework that uh, teacher workload is a consideration for us as governors. So all those things Linda's just said. Um, I think the only thing I would actually add to that is that we need to make sure as governors, we know that this is happening across the whole school. So it's not just focused on that year group that perhaps are sitting SATs tests or GCSEs or A-levels, but it's something that we've got a handle on as governors and we know what interventions are then being put in place right the way across the school. So you will be looking at how well pupils are doing, but you may also be looking at <clears throat> the number of pupils that have been engaged in in activities. If you're broadening out your extracurriculum uh, activities, there might be some data that is about participation rates or a, a larger number of clubs. So it, it will very much depend on what your journey uh, as a school looks like in terms of what do we see, what 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 numbers does it involve, what um, what presentations, it might be a presentation from a member of staff or pupils themselves that help you to understand the impact of those actions that are being um, put in place by the school. Yeah. And, and please, just for clarity, remember what we said earlier. Um, although Ofsted won't look at the school's own data, they actually will want to talk about it. They will want to say, OK, what does your data tell you? So whether it's in a special school or a mainstream school, what does the data say about pupil progress? What are you doing about it? and what difference does that make in terms of pupil outcomes and specifically from a special school um, perspective because we have a couple of questions on that theme um, how does what your curriculum is doing in terms of delivery prepare your youngsters for the next stage of their lives okay let's move on at that stage um, some of the evidence that Ofsted are suggesting that they will be looking at and therefore this does perhaps come back to a you know part of the answer for that last question um, but again, this isn't an exhaustive list and it's not a mandatory list either. This is some of the areas that Austin will be looking at. That doesn't mean to say we have to do all of these things ourselves. Um, and I think all of these we've actually sorry. mentioned in the conversations that we've been having with you so far. Um, but we do need to see some of these things in order for us as governors to understand what the impact of, of this work is, is demonstrating. Uh, first one on the list here is pupil progress. Now, this is pupil progress not from the perspective of looking at test or examination results, but pupil progress in terms of can we demonstrate that pupils know more, that they remember more and can do more. Now, from the government's perspective, that's actually quite difficult to get your head around. It's quite difficult to think about what we might expect in terms of uh, um, pure evidence on that. But I think it, it, it is something that we need to think about. It's something we perhaps need to develop on a school by school basis. But certainly, what sort of you know, milestones do we have in place? I mean, if we are, for example, lots of schools are using forest schools right now as a way of you know, developing you know, actually having an impact on children's personal development and well-being but there is some very real learning that goes out there so have we got some hard evidence that says children are acquiring new skills as a consequence of participating in forest schools forest school activities rather are they building their resilience are they taking more risks calculated risks etc all of those considerations i think fit into that first one as well as of course something that um, comes up in that penultimate bullet point there specifically for primary schools but reading how are children actually progressing in their reading often inspectors will be listening to children read in primary schools i'm not suggesting for one moment that's what we do as governors unless we're coming in as a, um, a as a volunteer doing that anyway but that is not part of our governor role uh, but we should be looking for evidence from the uh, school that children are making progress in their ability to read. Uh, one of the examples of that first bullet point in my own school where I'm a chair is that that developing long-term memory, if we take something like times tables, if you know and remember your timetables, when you come to being able to process more complicated um, uh, maths, 
you rely on your developed memory of times table. So you don't have to calculate that. You're already on to being able to do more because you've built that, that memory of your timetables in. So it's those types of things um, that, that they're relating uh, back there. And that, then that would be applicable across all of those subject areas. Uh, Andrew's asked a question here saying, is the pupil knowing more, remembering more, et cetera, not just still teaching to the test? which is what I thought Austin were trying to avoid. Uh, no, I would respectfully say it absolutely isn't, uh, Andrew. Apart from anything else, it's not just in those satable or testable subjects, it's across the curriculum. But an example of that might be, you know, children knowing how to set up a fair test in, the, in, the, in science, if they're doing some experimentation about rates of growth, etc. All of those are things that children, you know, they might pick up from being uh, having an engagement in gardening activities at school. It might be something that comes as a gardening club or perhaps as a science club, but it's about how we build up, how we consolidate on the taught curriculum. It's how we are actually developing skills as well as knowledge, because those are the ways in which, you know, memorable activities actually do, st do stick with children. That's about this excitement and motivation and how that comes back into the curriculum, I think. And it's, it's much more about being able to then apply those skills that have been learnt and remembered across a much wider and more complex uh, range of activities. Yeah. Performance data we've already talked about. Talking to pupils is a, you know, perhaps a fairly obvious one to put down there, but as governors, I wonder how much time we take to talk to pupils because that gives you a very good um, understanding, I think, of uh, you know, what children like in school about the curriculum. I mean, have we, you know, asking a child what, 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 you know, what subjects they're interested in, what are the most exciting things you do, that can tell us a lot as, as, as governors. It might be anecdotal, but it's nonetheless some um, evidence that might be valuable to us. Um, Particularly for um, secondary schools, of course, looking at destination data, um, you know, how many um, children proportion-wise go into the workplace, how many go into apprenticeships or other forms of training, um, as opposed to further and higher education, reading we've mentioned already. And of course, there is a specific focus on special educational needs and disabilities. How does the planning of the curriculum, the implementation of the curriculum, have an impact on those pupils? Because of course, they are of a, you know, a a group of pupils within you know, the total population of a school in terms of the curriculum for all, we need to focus as governors because, <clears throat> excuse me, Ofsted certainly will be focusing on how the curriculum meets their needs as well as everybody else's. Okay, so some of the questions that perhaps that leads us thinking about as uh, governors are reflected on this, uh, on this next slide. Um, most important one, of course, and we've picked up some of these things as we've gone through the session this morning, but yeah, how will we ensure that as a governing body, as a governing board, we do have an appropriately strategic overview? And I think that word appropriately is a really important one. This isn't about subject expertise from governance. This is about strategic understanding of what the curriculum is aiming to do, what it's actually doing, and what, the, what difference that's making to outcomes for children and young people in our schools. How, um, how are we actually going to um, know as governors that what we're doing curriculum-wise is good? It's not a judgment that can be made in isolation. There has to be some dialogue. There has to be perhaps some uh, scrutiny of Ofsted reports once they become a little bit more widespread from, the, from September this year onwards. Um, there has to be some um, you know, senior leadership dialogue, I would say, with teams in other schools talking about their experiences. Uh, and remember, no school should be working in isolation here. So many heads are in uh, uh, head teacher groups, many schools are in collaborative arrangements with other schools, uh, many academies are in multi-academy trust positions. So how do we know that what we're doing um, is comparable to, to what some of the other schools are, are doing in our area? On what lessons have been learned and shared that will help us bring that good practice best practice back into our school or, or, or indeed share across a wider group. So many of us will also have some kind of school improvement partner, uh, either from the local authority or from the uh, MAT. What judgments do they make about the quality of education uh, in our school? And are those shared, are those report formally shared with governors so that we can use that as a bit of external triangulation? Uh, and you might buy other services uh, that will 
particularly help you work on particular subject areas. So you might bring a specialist in or you might engage with a number of other schools about developing science across those schools. What is the feedback from the impact of those pieces of work? A couple of um, people are actually asking questions um, about curriculum progression here. And yeah, absolutely. One of those con um, constituent factors or a characteristic of a good curriculum will be that it does build progression. In other words, children build and consolidate on what they learn in year two, in year three. They, in, uh, um, the learning progresses in years four, five, and six, and on to secondary school, etc. So, yes, as governors, we should be asking the school to provide assurance to us that subject leaders um, are actually monitoring curriculum progression. We do know that subject leaders are going to be involved in far greater levels of um, discussion with Office of Inspectors than has been the case in the past. And I know that's something that's actually causing a little bit of concern in schools at the moment because of the, uh, the teacher workload uh, issues perhaps attached to that. But of course, the expectation of all teachers once they're qualified is that they do take on subject leadership. That means something slightly different in a very large secondary school, of course, but in a primary school, a small primary school, some uh, teachers will have leadership responsibilities for one, two, sometimes three subjects just because of the, uh, the head count going uh, around. And at a much earlier stage of their career, possibly, as well. Um, so it is important to understand what that looks like. And of course, yeah, the, the last the last question here, um, to think about evidence, yeah, it's not for us as governors to demand the evidence that we get, but if we're not getting the evidence that we need, we should be asking appropriate and uh, dare I say, and forgive me, I'm not teaching anyone to suck eggs here, polite questions about that, but head teachers and leadership teams in our schools should be thinking about what evidence do we need for when Ofsted come, and therefore what evidence will we be sharing with governors? I mean, I'm a great believer, and many of you will have heard me say this before, that I don't believe that the um, leadership of any school, head teachers and the rest of the leadership teams, should be providing anything particularly to satisfy the diet of governors. What we should be expecting as governors is for the leadership team to be sharing information with us, which they're using to lead the school. Now, some of that might be in summary form, but actually what we should be thinking, and again, that does make a contribution to um, uh, teacher workload, I would suggest. Okay, um, one second poll just before we finish the session this morning. Um, sorry, went too far then, I pressed the wrong button, apologies for that. Um, where are we? And this is really about your confidence level uh, as a board and, and whether you feel confident that um, your understanding is, is being given an opportunity to develop. So the poll is up there in front of you now and I can see people are rapidly uh, um, completing that. It's looking quite positive, so we've got again almost 70% of people have voted now so if you want to cast your vote now's the opportunity to do that folks because we are uh, just about to close that poll and I think most people have voted there so I'm going to close the poll now and share those results with you very quickly and you'll see that you know an overwhelming 64% so very nearly two-thirds of people have actually said uh, yes they have uh, certainly yeah, got a level of confidence Third, but just under a third saying they're not certain at this stage, and a very small number saying no. Um, again, if you're, a, I think for everybody, it's worth thinking about how much more do I need to know, how much more do I want to know, where do I go to find that information out. Um, but certainly, if you're not certain, ask your leadership team. Uh, but you know, perhaps have a have a focus on this in your next governing body or committee meeting that says, well, what's the school doing about the quality of education? How are we reflecting that in our self-evaluation documentation at the moment? And I think that quality, um, that characteristic of governance that's mentioned in the competency framework of being curious is possibly your strongest um, ally in this particular aspect. Um, for some of that 29% they are not certain. Um, when you realise that there's a lot you don't know, sometimes it, it creates a, a, a bit of a nervousness. Uh, but being curious will develop your confidence. How does this work here? What are we doing about it? Where might I look for more information? And 
I don't think we need to ask this question. There's lots of questions still coming through at the moment, but just in the last few moments of the, uh, the, the webinar, if there are any questions, now's your opportunity to uh, um, put those up. If we don't get the chance to actually respond to every question, we will go through all of the questions after the webinar and we'll respond to you directly. But we've got a couple of questions, we're trying to group them together here, relating to um, new governors particularly, and we have two or three people have said, I'm a new governor and I'm just wondering how I get my head around all of this. Um, don't forget you are just one governor on a governing board or a governing body. Governance is and always has been about collective responsibility. Um, there's a learning curve here. Um, you've participated in this webinar, hopefully you're taking something away from it this morning. Come to more webinars for Governors for Schools, uh, register with Better Governor, look at what we're doing. There's lots of articles on our site, um, people who have subscriptions actually can participate in our webinars, etc. There are lots of opportunities for governors to develop their understanding and their, their learning in this area and all other um, areas of their responsibility. And of course, those of you in local authority schools, it may well be that your local authority or other providers are offering training and development opportunities as well. Uh, yes, you won't be alone in front of an inspector, uh, if that's a fear as a new governor. It is a team effort and there will be a group of you. Um, if you haven't already done so, there is a handout um, that you can download from the, um, from the dashboard in front of you of the slides that we've used uh, to talk to you today. So uh, please, there's a little document icon somewhere on your screen that you'll be able to download that. So all that remains for us to say, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, um, all of the questions. If we haven't referred to your question individually, um, I hope you feel that we have actually um, covered the subject as uh, closely as we possibly can. As I say, we will scrutinise all of the questions. And there have been several hundred questions come through this morning after the webinar. And if there are any specific ones that we don't feel we've answered, we will get back to you individually. But thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, look out for the next Governors for Schools webinar and uh, hopefully uh, Linda and I will see you again soon on one that we facilitate. Thank you very much. Thank you.